didn't even notice the time. <laughs> There's still people coming in, which is good, which is good. All right. Good morning, everybody. It uh, didn't seem like we were getting started, but here we are. I didn't hear the bell ring either, but maybe it did. Anyway, all right, church has begun. A um, couple of announcements before we begin our worship service this morning. Um, first of all, uh, you have an insert about the building fund for the new carpet. As you uh, probably all know, the goal is $5,000. And actually, this is now updated. We currently have $3,443. And I understand there's more in the collection plate, so that will continue to go up. Um, we'll also be sending out a letter. Yes, sir. Um, no specific way on the online. Yeah, uh, I don't believe we have it set up that way. So, sorry about that. <laughs> just, yeah, yeah. So if uh, if you want to make a donation to the carpet fund, just make out your check to uh, First Baptist Church Cornelius and and put a uh, in the memo carpet fund. If uh, I don't know that there's a way to do it online. Um, but thanks for asking. Uh, something we might need to think about. Um, anyway, so that, that's continuing to go. The, the letter will go out. If you've already given, I don't know that because I don't see that kind of stuff. So you might get the letter from me a second time. Don't worry about it. Uh, I appreciate your donations. Uh, another uh, announcement about children's choir. So uh, Williams Place, the children from First Baptist Church and Mount Zion will be joining together into a children's choir on August 15th at 2 o'clock. That's the third Sunday in August. We're going to use our regular worship time up there to bring the children's choir, which they requested. So uh, practice will be during the children's church at 11 o'clock. And um, as I said, we'll partner with Mount Zion. And we would love to engage all the children, so please uh, bring them uh, and uh, let them join in and, uh, and learn the songs that they'll be singing. My understanding it's a more patriotic theme. We'll sing, of course, Jesus Loves Me and This Little Light of Mine, I think. And then there's uh, God Bless America and maybe another one. So praise God for that. Also, in, your bull in, in the bulletin, you'll see about the uh, VBS, the Vacation Bible School, which is coming up pretty quick, I think just two weeks ago, two weeks from now now. So uh, you can help through prayer or volunteering or supplies. So if you have any questions about that, see Diana Sharp or Denise Willis. Um, going over, yes, ma'am, you can say anything you want. Plastic bags from the grocery yeah, store. Grocery okay. Store yeah. A hundred of them. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Just put. Can you want? Can you handle that? Put a little box or something. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So, uh, shopping bags. Plastic shopping bags are needed for VBS. Thank you. Uh, there'll be a blood drive this Thursday in the fellowship hall from 10 o'clock until 2.30, and uh, everyone who is able to give blood is encouraged to do so. You can sign up at the Red Cross uh, website, uh, and in order to schedule an appointment for that, there's a sponsor code, FBCC, so it'll take you right to the correct sign-up. Uh, the New Ladies Sunday School starts in September. I'm excited about that, September 5th at 10 o'clock, and so uh, praise God for that. I think uh, Donna Pinion is heading that up. Is that correct, Donna? Kind of? More or less? <laughs> okay, maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> See Don Opinion. If you <laughs> all right, that's all the announcements I have other than our regular Wednesday uh, announcements. Wednesday morning begins with the men's breakfast at 7 o'clock in the fellowship hall. And then at 2 o'clock we have Bible study in the Larkins building, the parsonage, as well as via Zoom. Then at 6.30 we have another Bible study in the fellowship hall and via Zoom. And then at 7.30, we have choir practice, and uh, it's a full day on Wednesday. Any other announcements that need to be made before we go to worship? Seeing none, Terry, lead us in worship, please. It will once again, once again be my honor. You know, in the Great Commission, there's three verbs that the Lord commands us to participate in. One of them is go, one of them is baptize, one of them is teach. But before you can go, I think you have to come to church. I think you have to be supported by your church. I think you have to be taught by your church and things like that. So I think it's important, and I appreciate y'all being here. If you're out there on Facebook Live Land, please come join us. 
or we'd love to have you in in our church whenever the Lord leads you here in the book of Psalms the Bible says I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made let's stand while we sing our first hymn of today it's called he knows my name on the screen Time to lift up praise and prayers. A uh, couple of things. Uh, I want to start with a, a, a couple of praises to get it started off right. Uh, first of all, Dot Pender called me this morning. Uh, for those of you who, who know, we had the memorial service for Henry Pender yesterday here in the sanctuary, and she uh, wanted us to lift up a praise for the love of the church and what the church means to the Pender family and the love that they felt. So praise of uh, gratitude from Dot Pender and the Pender family. I want to lift up my daughter, Mary Beth, who got a job. So uh, that was good. She starts as a school teacher on Monday uh, up in Vance County. So uh, praise God for that. Uh, and then last night after we were done here, I headed up to uh, Jamestown for my father-in-law's 70th birthday party. So praise Al Stewart, uh, great man that he is. A uh, couple of others, uh, things going on here, handed to me. Uh, Char Kluvers fell at work last night, so I'm not sure anything about that. Uh, does anybody have any? Yeah, D Dana. Okay, oh all right, well, we'll keep Char in our prayers. Uh, keep the Pender family in our prayers as, uh, as they uh, continue to mourn the passing of Henry. Um, the waitress at Corrine's, Christy, needs traveling mercies, and so that's good. And that tells me that the ladies uh, heard in one of the sermon messages that one of the things that we can do, and it was actually something taught to me by the Gideons, was when you sit down at a restaurant to have your meal, you know, I'm assuming most of you all say some sort of blessing before you eat. Uh, it's nice to ask the waiter or waitress, hey, I'm going to say a blessing before I eat. Can I say a prayer for you? And very often you'll have people say, yeah, I, I need prayer. And uh, then you can lift them up and they get to feel the love of God through your uh, asking if they want prayer. So good for you, ladies. Um, Billy Reed, Pinion's cousin, has cancer treatments. So we'll keep Billy Reed in, in uh, the prayers. I've got a praise here. Carol Ballard's birthday is Tuesday. So happy birthday, Carol. Uh, we've got... Um, 
Nathan, which is Priscilla Mars's nephew, has COVID. Caddy, uh, Katie Perillo, Kit's granddaughter, how's she doing? Heart problems? Okay. Okay. Hadn't heard anything yet. Uh, Jacob Roberts, interim pastor. So that's another praise for that young man. Some of y'all who uh, have been here uh, when I've been gone, a young man named Jacob Roberts has come and preached a few times in, in my stead. And uh, he just emailed me, told me he got a job as an interim pastor down in Gaffney, South Carolina. So praise God for that. I'm happy for him and him following the calling. Uh, Alan Sharp, Angela Stevens' nephew, tumor surgery. Is that coming up? Okay, August 3rd, so keep uh, Alan Sharp in your prayers. In addition to those specific prayers, we always pray for our church, and not only our church, but the other churches that meet here, Revivia Iglesia Cristiana and uh, the Kachin Baptist Church, uh, all the churches, really, uh, throughout the world, and those Christians who are persecuted throughout the world. Pray for our government, and our leaders, our president, the Congress, and also the state and local officials. Uh, we pray for the military and our first responders. And uh, we also continue to pray for the, the Pender family, as we said. Are there other prayer requests or praises that need to come up? Yes, ma'am. Praise. I was here during that service yesterday, and I know a lot of guys maybe don't know Henry, and that's not the point of what I'm trying to say. But it was a great Sydney home celebration for him. And if he could have been in here and heard, his, his congregation was full. <laughs> and when they sang, it just brought cold chills. Um, I know that our church is going to be here again one day. It was a wonderful send-off for Henry. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that. Uh, when I counted, I counted 107 people in the sanctuary. And we had three empty pews, so we had more room for more. So uh, praise God for that. All right, anything else? Yes, Bobby. Uh, Manny Rosado, over here at the Neighborhood Center, he went to kids up in West Virginia to do mission work with people. Good for him. Praise God. Absolutely. All right, yeah, so Manny, he's, yeah, Manny Rosado is uh, on that mission. Good for him. Praise God for that. All right, any unspoken prayer requests? Let's just take it all to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning with praise and thanksgiving on our lips as we do each and every time we come before you, Lord, because you are worthy of our praise and you are uh, worthy of our thanksgiving. So, Lord God and Father, I thank you for what you have done for this church and in this church and through this church particularly for the, the people who had come before, Lord, men like Henry Pender and ladies like Dot Pender who had just been uh, such cornerstones of this church. Lord God, many folks who came before and many folks who will hear now and many folks who will come after as this church continues its mission to advance the kingdom of God. And so, Lord, I thank you for all of that. And Lord, I uh, lift up to you each and every one of these individual petitions and prayers, uh, folks who are sick, but also lift up the praise lord a lot of good things happen in as well so every aspect of our life you're a part of it lord and and that's a blessing and so lord continue to watch kindly over us continue to encourage us and continue to give us the strength to endure and give us the faith to go forward when we don't know what's going to happen but we know that you're with us and lord let us always do everything to advance your kingdom and bring glory to you and your son Jesus Christ in whom we pray amen the collection plate looks real full as I can look at it from here but so thank you all for your generosity and if you uh, haven't had the opportunity to drop your tithe or offering in the collection plate it's it's there at the back uh, on the way out as I said in regard to the building fund if you want to make a special donation for the building fund you're welcome to do that too. just designate it as the carpet fund or the building fund for those of you who are home watching on Facebook live uh, you're encouraged and welcome to continue to finance the ministry of this church you can send your donation and tithe into First Baptist Church of Cornelius PO Box 100 Cornelius North Carolina 28031 or use the uh, website donation page and thank you all for your generosity for this church. Okay. In the book of Acts, the Bible says, those who have been scattered preach the word wherever they went. May that be our task as we move forward and go out into the world today. 
Our next hymn is hymn number 444. I love to tell the story. Let's stand while we sing. Thank him for everything that he has loaned us for our use while we're here on this earth. To thank him for all the tithes and offerings and love offerings that were brought into his churches all over the world today. Let us pray. Oh, my most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, 
what a blessing it is to pause to take a deep breath of the good air that you give us Lord to take a big breath of the life that you give us to come into your house to worship the, with those to worship with our friends those of a like mind Lord to worship with those that love you more than anything else more than anything else Lord undergird us Lord help us to be the people you'd have us to be help us to be the Christians that you'd have us to be help us to be the witnesses that you'd have us to be Help us not to just sing that song, Lord. Help us to live it. Help us to truly love to tell the story of your saving grace that you so richly blessed us with. Thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy, Lord, poured out on us, your people here on earth, your people gathered here today. Heavenly Father, we do ask your blessings upon all the tithes and offerings and love offerings that were brought into your churches all around the world today, Lord. We pray that you'll use them, Lord. We pray that you'll multiply them like you did the fish and the loaves. That you'll most multiply them for the upbuilding of your kingdom here on earth so that more people will hear the, will hear the story the story of your love the story of your sacrifices made for us we thank you for this church and what it means to all of us Lord we thank you for this campus we pray that we'll use it the way you'd have us to use it Lord we ask that you undergird all the speakers throughout the world who are the bringing who are bringing your message to your people today may it make a difference Lord may it make a difference in our world our sin sick dusty world Lord help us to be a better world Lord help us to treat people the way that they want to be treated Lord Help us to truly do to others as we would have them do to us. Please forgive us for our many sins and shortcomings. Help us, Lord, to walk a little closer to you each day. Help us to be a little bit more like Jesus and a lot less like ourselves every day. Of course, in the beautiful, powerful, holy name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord, Lord, you are all we'll ever need. Amen.
Amen. Amen. Thank you, David. Next one. Terry, I believe that's yours. <laughs> that's right. People pick up after me all the time, so don't worry. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> uh, be- before I begin, um, my Cash had asked me to include the Cash family in the prayer request, and I forgot. I didn't write it down, so please remember the Cash family as well. Amen is right. Okay. Last week, I I talked a little bit about not doing things just because that's the way we've always done them, and so today I'm going to actually ask you not to stand during the reading today. Uh, No disrespect to the Lord's word, but it's going to be a rather long reading. It's going to be about six minutes, and I don't want you all standing there thinking, when is he going to finish? I want you to, <laughs> I want you to be comfortable because I want you to hear these words. Uh, I want you to hear the mighty acts of God over the history of the Jewish people, and uh, it'll all make sense when we uh, get to the sermon. So I'm going to begin <clears throat> with Hebrews chapter 11 at verse 1. Now faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen. For by it our ancestors won God's approval. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. By faith Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith he was approved as a righteous man because God approved his gifts. And even though he is dead, he still speaks through his faith. By faith, Enoch was taken away, and so he did not experience death. He was not to be found because God took him away. For before he was taken away, he was approved as one who pleases God. Now without faith, it is impossible to please God, since the one who draws near to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith, Noah, after he was warned about what was not yet seen and motivated by godly fear, built an ark to deliver his family. By faith he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith Abraham, when he was called, obeyed and set out for a place that he was going to receive as an inheritance. He went out even though he did not know where he was going. By faith he stayed as a foreigner in the land of promise, living in tents as did Isaac and Jacob, co-heirs of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith, even Sarah herself, when she was unable to have children, received power to conceive offspring, even though she was past the age, since she was considered that the one who had promised was faithful. Therefore, from one man, in fact, from one as good as dead, came offspring as numerous as the stars of the sky, and as innumerable as the grains of sand along the seashore. These all died in faith, although they had not received the things that were promised, but they saw them from a distance greeted them and confessed that they were foreigners and temporary residents on the earth. Now those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they were thinking about where they came from, they would have had an opportunity to return. But they now desire a better place, a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, He received the promises, and yet he was offering his one and only son, the one to whom it had been said, your offspring will be called through Isaac. He considered God to be able to raise someone from the dead, therefore he received him back, figuratively speaking. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith, Jacob went when he was dying, blessed each of his sons of Joseph, and he worshipped leaning on his top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, as he was nearing the end of his life, mentioned the exodus of the Israelites and gave instructions concerning his bones. By faith, Moses, after he was born, was hidden by his parents for three months because they saw that the child was beautiful and they didn't fear the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter and chose to suffer with the people of God rather than enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. For he considered reproach for the sake of Christ to be greater than wealth than the treasures of Egypt, since he was looking ahead to the reward. By faith he left Egypt behind, not being afraid of the king's anger. For Moses persevered as one who sees him who is invisible. 
By faith, he instituted the Passover and the sprinkling of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch the Israelites. By faith, they crossed the Red Sea as though they were on dry land. When the Egyptians attempted to do this, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after being marched around by the Israelites for seven days. By faith, Rahab the prostitute welcomed the spies in peace and didn't perish with those who disobeyed. And what more can I say? Time is too short for me to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets, who by faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the raging fire, escaped the edge of the sword, gained strength and weakness, became mighty in battle, and put foreign armies to flight. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Other people were tortured, not accepting release so that they might gain a better resurrection. Others experienced mockings and scourgings, as well as bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawed in two, they, would, they died by the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins, in goatskins, destitute, afflicted, mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and on mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. All these were approved through their faith, but they did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us so that they would not be made perfect without us. Therefore, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance and sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith. And all God's people said, Amen, Amen, Amen. Avery, go ahead and put up that first slide, would you please? Thank you. What is now known as First Baptist Church of Cornelius was established in 1904. This is a picture of the original structure which we're in today. Next slide, please. The first pastor was Claudius Murchison. That's him and his family. He preached from this very place in the beginning. And he was here for a short while. And then shortly thereafter, the second pastor, W.A. Huff, he came and he was the pastor for a few years. Now, we know that Huff was active in the temperance movement. That was the movement to ban alcohol in the United States. Remember, this is back in 1905, 1906. Uh, in 1919, that actually succeeded with the 18th Amendment and the manufacture, distribution, and purchase of alcohol was banned in the United States. And then in 1933, that amendment got repealed. The next pastor to come along was Reverend T.L. Cashwell. He was the youngest pastor to ever serve First Baptist Church. He was 22 years old when he started. We don't have a picture of him. But we know that he not only preached here, but at four Baptist churches in the area. First Baptist Cornelius, which at the time was called Cornelius Church, by the way. Cornelius Church, he preached at Rockwell Baptist, Huntersville Baptist, and Hopewell Baptist. He bought a horse and buggy in order to get around to all the churches. So that tells you something, too. And in 1920, a little over 100 years ago, he sold that horse and buggy to Luther Pender, who was one of the founders of First Baptist Church of Cornelius and whose son, Henry, we laid to rest yesterday. The stories of the history of First Baptist Church go on and on. Baptisms in the Catawba River, the reversal of the sanctuary. At one time, you all would have been facing that way and I would have been over there and the baptistry was over there. And then they turned it back again. <laughs> <laughs> they dug out underneath this building to create a fellowship hall. Imagine that. They built the Larkins building in the uh, 60s, the Parsonage. They built the fellowship hall. They built the education building. Over the past 117 years, a lot has happened here in what we now call First Baptist Church of Cornelius. And by God's grace, a lot will happen over the next 117 years. Now, none of us were here 117 years ago. 
None of us were a part of that original congregation. None of us helped to build this sanctuary, and I doubt many of us had much to do with any of the things that I've mentioned so far. Yet we are here, and we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Reverend Murchison, Reverend Huff, Reverend Cashwell, the Penders, the Wallies. You need only look around at the stained glass windows, the Moonies, the Archers, families that were foundational to the building of this church, those who went before us to give us what we have today. They left a legacy for us to enjoy, and we have a responsibility to leave a legacy for the next generation to come. And so for the lesson today, as a church, we must keep our focus on the advancement on the kingdom of God. Keeping our eyes on Jesus and laying aside every hindrance and sin that could prevent us from fulfilling the Great Commission. Building on the foundation laid by those who came before us and erecting a beacon of hope for those who will come after us. And so before I turn to the passage today, let me just uh, touch on a little bit about the book we call Hebrews. It's very often called Paul's letter to the Hebrews, but today we don't really think Paul wrote it. And we don't really think it was a letter. It seems more like an essay or a sermon. It doesn't have those regular uh, marks of a letter. The author is unknown, but the audience was definitely Jewish converts to Christianity. And the purpose of the letter is twofold. First, to exalt Christ as superior over all the things from the Old Testament. Superior to Moses, superior to the temple, superior to the sacrifices, and on and on the writer tells the readers. And then secondly, it is to urge those believers to persevere and advance the faith in face of persecution and difficulties, just as the heroes of the Old Testament that I read had done before them. And so we're going to begin there with that great cloud of witnesses that chapter 11 tells the history of the Jewish people all the way from creation up until Joshua and beyond. And those heroes are repeatedly commended for their faith. But more than that, they're commended for the fruit that the faith produced. Fruit of taking action by faith. Noah built an ark by faith. Abraham left his homeland by faith. They crossed the Red Sea by faith. All these different things were done in faith. And what's strange as you read that, they never saw the results of their fruit. It says that Moses never entered the promised land, although he had led the people to its borders. Abraham never saw the multitudes of the descendants that were promised to him. He never saw his descendants inhabit the land. He never saw the blessing to the world that is his son and seed, Jesus Christ. Yet despite all their trials and sufferings, they persevered in faith. And for all of this, the heroes of the Old Testament won the approval of God. And they, metaphorically, for the readers of the book of Hebrews, make up what is called this great cloud of witnesses. Those heroes who are in heaven today looking down on the Hebrews with encouragement and expectation that the next generation will pick up where they left off and continue the advancement of the kingdom of God. And it was the death of Henry Pender that made me think about this passage today. As I considered Henry's passing and all that he and Dot had done for the church, I was reminded that he was a second generation behind his father, Luther. And then as I thought, I thought about Jerry Wally. Jerry Wally and her husband, Tom. Jerry just passed away in February. And she lived her entire life in the church. She told me stories of when she was a little girl, what's the parking lot now was actually had a house which was her grandfather's house, and he was a founding member of the church. And he would come and get the coal-fired furnace started because that was the way they heated the place. And his grandmother was, or her grandmother was in a wheelchair, couldn't get in because you don't have handicapped ramp, ramps back then. And so they would wheel her out onto the porch and then open the windows. And as the preacher preached, she could hear the sermon from 
her porch. Beautiful stories, beautiful stories about folks who came before us. And as you look around at the stained glass windows, each one is dedicated to someone who gave their heart and soul to this church. And those who came before us laid the foundation that we enjoy today. And I imagine Henry and Jerry and all those others who went before us, just like the heroes of the Old Testament who looked down on the Hebrews, I imagine in my mind, there they are in the clouds looking down at us and looking down with an encouragement and an expectation. Will we continue the advancement of the kingdom of God? Will we continue the legacy of great men and women like Jerry Wally and Henry Pender? And so to begin, I want you to think about the person or the persons who have made the greatest impact on your life from this church. Some may have gone before us, some may be with us today, but think about what they did that made the impact on you. And then ask yourself, how can I continue that legacy? How can I be Henry Pender to one of you? You see, the handoff comes because the Christian life is like a relay race. Right? In, in verse 12, 2, the writer says, Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Now, like a relay race, the heroes of old handed off the baton to the readers of Hebrews. The metaphor of the race is a common one in the New Testament because it's so indicative of the Christian life. We're always to be moving forward. We're always to be pressing on to the goal, as Paul told us in Philippians 3. The race is long. The race is tiring. It requires perseverance of will, conditioning of the body, and determination to finish the race. When you read this passage, I want you to think about the relay race. The first runner hands off the baton to the next, who then runs his course and hands it off to the next who runs his course, and so on. This is what is happening. The great cloud of witnesses, they ran their race. And now it's time for the Hebrews to take the baton and do the same. But for the transition to be successful, the runner receiving must be ready to take the baton. I don't know if you ever have seen it, but when there's a relay race, the runner who is going to receive will put his left arm back. And the left arm needs to be palm up and ready to grasp the baton because the runner with the baton will hold the baton in his right hand and lay it down into the left hand. And they have right and left so that they don't do right and right and step on each other's feet and trip each other. Okay? And then the one who's receiving isn't waiting like this. The one who's receiving is already in stride. So he's got that running start, and they drop that baton, and off he goes. It's a great picture of what should be happening in the church, how this transition can be successful. So as you think about the great people who came before us and the legacy that they're handing off, I want you to think about the baton that's being handed off to you. Are you even ready to receive the baton? Is your palm up? Are you already in stride? And once you get that baton in your hands, what are you going to do with it? Now, I said that this is somewhat of a relay race, but the writer of Hebrews goes on to explain it's actually more like an obstacle course or a steeplechase. The, revi- the writer says to let us run with endurance the race that lies before us. Oh, excuse me. Let us lay aside every hindrance and sin that so easily ensnares us. In this way, the race is like an obstacle course. There are hindrances and sins that entangle us. The Greek word that is translated as hindrance in mine is better translated as weight. And that's what it says in the King James Version. Let us cast off every weight that we carry. And that makes sense. If you're running a race, you don't want extra weight. You don't want to be weighted down as you try to run the race. You have to cast it off. 
The second hurdle is sin. Let us lay aside every sin that so easily ensnares. To run effectively, you need your legs to be free, right? Your legs are ensnared or entangled, and then you trip and fall. Sin causes us to trip and fall as we run the race. And both the weight and the sin can either be our own or it can be someone else's. And it's likely both. From being our own for our own internal weights and sins, we might be weighted down with doubt or fear or indecision or even indifference. And we may be tangled in sins that we have not yet been able to free ourselves from. Or maybe things like envy or selfishness or pride or prejudice. And those weights from outside us are things that we carry that are put on us. All right? I'd call it the monkey on our back. There are those who seek to slow down the runners and prevent them from finishing the race. The monkeys are determined to undermine the runner. And there's monkeys in every organization. There's monkeys in every church. There's monkeys in this church. And you can need to ask yourself, am I a runner or am I a monkey? All right, because we don't want to be slowed down. We might get entangled in the sins of others. Those who cause divisions and strife in the church. Those who gossip or conspire to upset the work. All of these things are external and need to be cast off. So are you the runner or are you the monkey on the back? And if you're the runner, are you seeking to advance the kingdom of God? And if you're the monkey, are your actions creating obstacles for faithful runners? If you're the runner, you might be asking, well, how do I get this monkey off my back? And the writer of Hebrews gives us the answer. He says that if the baton has been handed off to the Hebrew believers, and if the race is going to be won, the weights and sins that challenge it, both internally and externally, need to be cast off. And they're cast off in two ways. And the first one is endurance. Let us run with endurance. Never give up. It's easy to throw in the towel. It's easy to give up. That's what the monkey wants you to do. Instead, cast off the monkey. Put aside all hindrances and run. Just don't give up, no matter how hard it is. Endure, as the writer says. And then he says something else. Let us keep our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith. Keep your eyes on Jesus as you run. Jesus is the finish line. Jesus is the goal. Fix your eyes on him. Don't be distracted by the monkey circus around you. Run with your eyes ahead and focus on the task of the race. Years ago, I ran a half marathon, and you can imagine it was many years ago. After nearly 13 miles, I was exhausted. But I could see the finish line up ahead. And I just focused on that finish line, and I just continued to go. And eventually, I crossed the finish line. So I need to ask, what weights or sins might be slowing you down? Are they yours or someone else's? And how might you cast them off? And then, what is the goal that Jesus is having you focus on? What is the baton being handed off for you to accomplish the race in his name? These are things that we need to answer so that we can take this church forward and continue the legacy of that great cloud of witnesses whose names, some, are inscribed in these windows and others we remember in history. And so today I ask you to do a few things. First, recognize the achievements of those who went before us. And then take hold of your responsibility to continue where they left off. Cast off the weights and sins that might slow you down. And never give up. And always keep your eyes on Jesus.
And all God's people said, Amen. Someday, 117 years from now, I'll be laid to rest if the Lord doesn't come first. And maybe somebody will say, well, there was a guy, and they'll put a picture of me up there on some sort of plasma screen thing that we can't even imagine right now. Maybe it'll be like a, what are those uh, 3D things, hologram, right, whatever. And they'll all look at the suit I was wearing and laugh because that was the kind of dress we wore now and that kind of thing. And like y'all laugh at my suit now. Anyway, so, but no, it, 117 years from now, I hope that people remember all of us. And they'll say, you know what? Back there 117 years ago, right after the pandemic, that church could have gone two different ways. It could have crumbled or it could have gone forward. And praise God, it went forward. Look how huge First Baptist Church of Cornelius, a thousand members or whatever, right? Making an impact all throughout the lake area. All right, think big. It can happen. What do you think those folks who started this church were thinking, right? There was only like 40 or 50 from what we know, right? They built this place by hand. They dug out underneath to make the fellowship hall. I can't even comprehend that, right? Why didn't they just build another building? <laughs> but that's the way they did it, right? There's been so many wonderful memories in this church, but you guys can create the new memories, right? So when your great-grandchildren come to this church right now I'm, I'm, so sally mathis lois lois avery avery someday children lord willing and great grandchildren you'll be sitting over there and they'll be running the machine back there right and you'll say i remember that reverend judge he was a nut and he talked about the future but yeah i mean think that's cool stuff right all these little kids that we got running around who knows what the lord has in store for us but we've got a responsibility to pick up that legacy, right? And so I ask you to consider that today all the more. And if, if you don't think you have the strength, first of all, you don't have the strength on your own. And so if you don't have Christ in your life, you need Christ in your life. That's first and foremost. You're not going to build the kingdom until the kingdom is built inside of you. So if there's anybody here who has never received the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I encourage you to come forward today when Terry leads us in the invitational hymn, and we will welcome you into the kingdom of God today. Praise Jesus. All right, if you are a believer and you have something on your heart you want to share with me, come forward. Praise, prayer, whatever it is. All right, that's why we're here. We're praying people. And then if there's anybody here who would like to become a member of the church, come forward make that intention known as well. But first and foremost, the altar call, the invitations for those who'd like to give their life to Christ today. So Terry, can you please come on up and lead us? And In the book of Philippians, the Bible says, this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more. Let's stand as we sing hymn number 634. It's called More Love to Thee. More Love to Thee.